It's time for this week's episode of Brandon Sports Talk, featuring in-depth interviews from those who are trending in the world of athletics. And now, here's the host of Brandon Sports Talk, Brandon Pate. Welcome back to Brandon Sports Talk. In today's episode, I have the privilege to interview the Canada Alpine skier Olympian, Britt Janik. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Can you talk about how you knew that you wanted to get into the sport of alpine skiing? Oh, how I got into it. Um, it was kind of uh, not by choice. I had a family and parents that were really into skiing. So on weekends as a young kid, that's what we did. We came to Whistler and uh, we skied. And that's kind of how it all started. How is it like obviously being raised in a skiing family and growing up skiing? Well, I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty special because the sport itself was revolved around like us doing the sport was around time together as a family and it really created a passion for the sport. So it wasn't really work or a task that had to be done. It was really about creating this fun space to um, go and ski. What was your inspiration behind getting started with Team Canada? I think my inspiration from a young age, I was pretty um, keenly interested in, in watching sports or I tuned into the Olympics. I don't remember a clear moment when I decided I want to go to the national team and I want to be an Olympian, but I just kept being driven. Like there was this internal drive to keep trying to get to that next level and be that, you know, be that bit better. And um, then it became, I watched, um, past Canadian um, alpine skiers like a Kate Pace or a Carrie Mullen and all these, you know, all these, and Eddie Podovinsky, these names, and I would watch them. And I, you know, they looked so proud to carry the nation's flag on their back and compete um, for their country. And that seemed pretty fantastic to me. <laughs> of course, first, what were some of your favorite memories competing and skiing with your family? Well, I can remember as a young kid on um, Blacko Mountain, um, and racing my brother in the little like the little pot the race you know the little race course that most mountains have it's just kind of a straight course set up but it was before I'd even started racing and um, I remember always uh, my brother and I always asking um, my parents if we could go on the course and then there was one particular run and my brother and I would always have a race um, to see who could tuck the fat you know get the fastest across the cat track from the end of one run to lift it was like almost probably three minutes of tucking and there was always a little race happening there. <laughs> what were some of your favorite memories competing just as yourself? Well, um, I think I could take that to almost every moment in the start gate that, that almost that, that moment of quiet and silence when you put your poles over the wand and I would always have this, this kind of tradition or this um, habit of looking across the valley and I would picture the Whistler, you know, what the valley looks like in Whistler. So wherever I was racing around the world, I could always bring myself home. And that split second, that little moment of kind of calm uh, before you push out of the gate was um, definitely still a memory that I cherish. Um, yeah, yeah, almost every day. Of course, what were some of your routine? What are some of your routines that you do before you push out the gate? Yeah, so that's one of my routine of, I would always like, you'll see racers, they maybe click their poles before they put their poles over the wand and get ready so they do a 10 second countdown or a beep would go and that's your 10 second cue so i would always tap my poles and i would look out across the valley wherever i was whether it was a race in italy or austria switzerland and i would picture what the valley across from whistler mountain would look like so that it kind of brought me home and reminded me of what um why i was why i was there in the start gate and that was definitely a practice that i took into every single race of course, how is that like getting to travel the world, like you said, and go to Australia, Italy, and get to compete? It's pretty It's pretty special. I, at first, as a young 17, 18-year-old, um, I definitely got a lot uh, pretty homesick, and it felt pretty foreign and far away. Now, we go back, this is 97, 98, and cell phones weren't really a thing. It was hard to reach, you know, to, to reach home. There wasn't really email access. It was, it was completely different, right? So now the, the ability to just pick up a phone and message and connect to Wi-Fi. So, so that communication piece is different, but I feel that it really 
forced me to stand up on my own two feet and learn where I was and figure out. And so as the years went on, I really started to appreciate more and more the, that opportunity to travel and to experience all the different cultures. Of course, what are some of the things that you've learned so far about alpine skiing before that you didn't know before you got in, started into the sport? Oh, so some things that I didn't know. Um, well, before I started racing, I didn't, you know, I certainly didn't know a thing about racing. I had been an avid skier, our family, my mom was a ski racer. So she obviously could, you know, knew ski racing, but it wasn't shared a lot. She just really wanted us to be passionate skiers and to love the sport. So that first year at 11 years old, when I joined the Western Mountain Ski Club and then, and, and kind of combined with all these other kids that had already been racing for a couple of years and they knew what was up. And I was definitely a little unsure and didn't know, but I liked I just I, I learned as I went I would I didn't know what a giant slalom um, event was what the slalom was and all of that stuff so yeah that first year was uh, a steep learning curve. Of course what is that like getting to compete in the giant slalom and the giant slopes? Um, it's fun it's ex it's it's like a dance so to me skiing is uh, a dance on snow and when you catch the rhythm of a course and the rhythm of a hill you know after you've practiced in your mind and you're executing it well uh there's really there's no other feeling like it what does it mean to obviously represent team canada and put on that canada maple leaf flag that moment of being able to of first knowing that you are selected to the team is a really proud moment and anything like world championships or the Olympics to, to make that criteria and make that selection is some of the proudest moments I've had in my career. And then staying in the start gate, you know, it's, there's a bit of pressure there and expectation, but learning to manage that and take in the energy and knowing that it's, you know, it's an opportunity that you've earned. And that is really what carried me through moments like, you know, staying in the start gate at the Vancouver Olympics and um, yeah, really, really uh, nice memories to look back on. Of course, what was that feeling like the first time you got announced to be a part of the Team Canada Alpine Ski? Yeah, it was a special moment. It was uh, a time when I was still pretty young. So I was 17 turning 18 when I qualified for the national team. And um, I expect, I, you know, I knew that I had the ability to reach that level, but it's still, it's not real until it's announced. And I would say almost every year after that, every time I got announced, it never... It, it never faded that excitement and that energy of knowing that you're you're back there with your national team. Is that like obviously making the Vancouver team and get to go to Vancouver to compete in your first Olympics? Yeah, so the Vancouver 2010 Olympics was really special. I got to race on my home mountain. And it was also nearing the end of my career. I knew that it was probably the last Olympics I would go to and I had missed the previous two. So I felt a lot of pressure on myself to to make those games and um it did not fit like the experience was beyond my just beyond what I ever could have imagined it was truly a special moment of course what was that like getting to compete in Vancouver on your home area yeah so on my home area it was well, it was fun. It was the mountains. Like I said, that, that tradition that I had of stepping into the start gate and looking across the valley and imagining the Whistler, what Whistler looked like. Well, I stood there in the start gate and I didn't have to imagine it because it was right there. And I thought that I would feel more nerves and more stressed about the competition because I was on my home hill. But in fact, what happened is when I looked out the gate or when I inspected the course in the morning or skied up, I saw all these familiar faces, all the course workers that were volunteering at the Olympics were all friends, family that I had seen that, and they had seen me through most of my career. And all of a sudden I was saying hi to friends and to, to close family. And it was, a, it, it just settled me and uh, really calmed me right down. How's that like getting to compete in front of your friends and family in Vancouver? So the roar, when I finished my first event at the Vancouver Olympics was the downhill. And I had a great finish. I finished sixth overall, but the noise that I heard when I crossed the finish line was 
the loudest roar I've ever experienced. And of course there's, there were people in that crowd that I didn't know, but there were many, many people in that crowd that had seen me from when I was a little girl. There were friends that I raced with that were no longer racing that were in the crowd with their families. And it, when it came to my second event, the super giant solemn, a couple days later, I made a mistake partway through partway up the slope and nearly went out of the course. And what drove me to stay in and finish was that I just wanted to hear that roar again. I wanted to get that experience um, from the crowd one more time. What's that feeling like getting to compete in the World Cup the first time versus your last time competing? Mm, so the first time, my first time I competed in the World Cup was in a giant psalm race in Teen, France. I was young. I was very... <laughs> green I didn't know um where I would slot in and what this experience all these big world kind of world cup names that I had been watching um on tv all of a sudden I was standing with them uh on the ski hill inspecting and so that was a real kind of eye-opening moment and then to finish that first race and go okay I think I you know like I belong here and the difference, my last race, I was there in the start gate and I just took a moment and I knew I could see the younger ones there. I could see the new names there having their first experience. Um, and I felt pretty proud to have been a, to have been there for so long in the World Cup and to, um, to, to really be a name that was there on the World Cup and, and uh, think back to how it all started. <laughs> what was that moment when you got to live out your Olympic dream? Yeah, so the moment of, well, it's the, I think about it in two ways. It's that moment of pushing out of the start gate and then the moment of crossing the line and the moment of looking up and seeing my placing that I had done my best and it just, it fell just short of a medal, but it was the best that I could do on that day. And um, I feel so proud of that um, and it will yeah, it's, it's, it, I could close my eyes and see it all again in a split second. How is that feeling like getting to put on the Olympic rings and have Team Canada's Maple Leaf flag on you? Yeah, it's really special. When you're in it, it's, you know, you have to keep your race focus and you kind of take it in, but it doesn't really sink in at least for me until after the event. When I had finished my races and we went on to the next World Cup, I, there was just this big kind of overwhelm of emotions that came out because you realized that you had managed to get through it and have, have a good event and good races. And um, you start to see the little moments where, you know, you got to stand proudly for your nation. Of course, after the Vancouver Olympics, did you know that that would be your last Olympics? I did. I'd always wanted to compete one more season. So at the Vancouver Olympics, I was um, 29 turning 30 I'd been on the team for about 13 years already and you know granted I could have kept going I just kind of knew that it was it was the right time and so I competed one more season the the following world championship season and it was a really really fantastic way to um, carry the energy from the Olympics into that next season but also just kind of let it wash away and and kind of re readjust my my mindset there. Of course, as a professional athlete, how was that experience like competing on the Olympics and then retiring? Well, it feels pretty special because you still have the the energy and the fact that the Olympics had been in our hometown. So the following May in 2011, when I announced my retirement, I came to Vancouver for a little um, kind of retirement presentation. And there was definitely, you know, there was a lot of attention around it, a lot of excitement. So I feel like I got a really nice send off, which which was is pretty special because I, you know, I had put so much time and energy into my career, into competing for the Canadian ski team, but also, you know, a lot of energy had been put into me to support my career from um, our national organization. So it's, it was a really important moment. Yeah. What is it like, obviously now getting to meet your fans and having them recognize you and ask for your autographs and photos? Yeah, it's that it, it's fun and it doesn't get old. Um, it's, a special moment because it's a way for me to give back to the sport. And now I have two little girls that want to, that want to race and I get to coach um, here at the local ski club and I get to give back just to, to the sport in small ways. In the summertime, I do some fitness camps with them. And um, I know that just my energy and the, and the passion to try and strive to do your best and my passion for the sport, if it can get, 
passed on or or you know absorbed in any little way then um then I you know I feel great about that what was that feeling like when you received your Olympic ring and it had Vancouver 2010 on it and the Canada Maple Leaf flag on it yeah it's a special moment especially um it was an incredible moment for me because I had missed the Salt Lake Olympics in 2002, just narrowly by one result. I had missed the 2006 Torino Olympics and watched my close friends and teammates go off and compete. And so to have made the 2010 Olympics in my hometown and to have competed well in them um, was, yeah, it was, it felt, uh, it was, it was a big moment and um, a really, a really proud one. Who are some of the people that you look up to in the sport of alpine skiing? Well, early in my career, I can remember in grade, I was, what age are you in grade six? But I did a, I did a report on um, Kate Pace, Lindsay, who was a top downhiller at that time. But I can remember my first, even as a 15 year old, my first downhill and super G event that I went to at Lake Louise and the national team um, girls were there. And I remember looking up to the likes of Melanie Turgeon, who really led the way and, um, I had, there's an old ski racer, Edith Rosa, who was um, my babysitter at one point when I was a little girl. And so there was all these little connections. And now as I am, you know, a more retired athlete and a mom myself, I can see the little, the little connections. There's a couple um, guys on the ski team right now on the downhill and super G team. And the year that I stopped racing, I went and coached at a summer camp and they wanted to race me for a set of my world championship poles. And so we had a little race, a little dual slalom race. And it's all those little moments, right? That's just those little moments where you can um, pass your, that, that passion for the sport and the passion for competing, right? To, to strive to do your best. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's definitely many role models along the way. I loved, loved watching um, the German racer catch a Seisinger. And a moment that really stands out is my first top 10 finish in the giant slalom ever was in uh, Sestria, Italy. And I had just made the second run. So I was 29th after first run. And what that means is that you flip the order. So I got to start um, earlier in the, in the second run. I was one of the first people down the course in the second run. And I ended up having the fastest time in the second run, finished eighth place. But not only that is I finished ahead of one of Austria's all-time stars, Alexander Meisnitzer. And I remember looking up the board of the finish line and seeing my name above hers. And that's when I realized that I could play with the big names and that I was one of them and I could very much be one of them that was there all the time. Of course, what is that? What was that like getting to compete against those teams like Australia and Team USA during your time? Yeah, well, I think it's, you know, as Canada, we're a strong winter nation and we're a strong ski nation. The difference with Alpine skiing is most of our World Cup season is, is over in Europe. So um, we are away from home a lot. Uh, a lot of my winters, a lot of Christmases I spent in Europe, we spent we weeks on end on the road. So you have to become a really cohesive team, whereas the European nations often get to race on the weekend and then go home for two nights and then come back for the next race. Whereas those two nights where they got to go home, we were staying in a hotel, we were moving around. So there is a difference and it takes a little bit more grit and a real commitment to, to being there and keeping your energy up and really knowing why you're there. It's having a deep understanding of what, you know, what you want to accomplish and why am I here and what does it mean by, by staying committed to this. Who are some of the influential people in your career that have shaped you into the alpine skier that you are? Yeah, so the influential people throughout my career would have to be some of my coaches. Um, I have many that I could name, but um, one in particular, uh, Jim Pollock, who was my coach for many years, and just, uh, yeah, really helped me to believe that I could be um, one of the best in the world. Um, my mom was also, and I would say both my parents, um, I always go to my mom because she was the athlete and the skier, but my dad was kind of like just the calm, you know, he wasn't the athlete, but he was just, you know, he was always balanced out. They balanced each other's energy well and really just supported me through so many ups and downs. 
And it was that consistent support that I would say kept me going and was allowed me to, to make, you know, that Olympic team near the end of my career and um, reach my best results. What was that like, obviously, getting to live out your Olympic dream right before you ended your career? Yeah, it was exciting. Um, and also really nerve wracking because I knew that it was maybe, you know, probably my last chance. And what would that feel like if I didn't, you know, I really had to go bo through both scenarios. What would that feel like if I didn't make the team? Would I be okay with that? And then how would that feel? So it's, it's a real mental game and it's playing these, you know, playing out each scenario in your mind. And I did the same when I decided to stop. I, even though I knew that it was probably the right time to stop, it still wasn't an easy decision to retire. And I would have like, I would go to bed and have dreams of winning another world cup and staying with it. And that I kept going and the next night I ha would have a dream of the complete opposite that I decided to hang on my skis. And I was, so I probably went through almost a month of going back and forth like that. And I'm so glad that I gave myself the space to do that and allowed all of those kind of emotions and moments to come in because um, then uh, I felt that I had made the right decision. And yeah, the, the end of my career was, was bittersweet. I, you never really are ready for it to end or to, to hang them up, I guess, but um, there does come a time. <laughs> What's the transition like from going from retiring, being an alpine skier to getting into the corporate world and starting a family and stuff? Yeah. So that transition um, was challenging, I would say. Um, I know a lot of athletes that do find it challenging and some don't. I um, was really fortunate to jump right in and start a family. Um, within a few months of me announcing my retirement, I was pregnant with our first daughter and now I have this amazing 10 year old. And over the last 10 years, um, I'd say I've gone through a lot of um, self-discovery. I've learned how to be someone like to still be at that ski racer. I still have this, um, this this history that that I can bring with me today but who am I outside of the sport and I think that's a really important thing to discover even while you're in sport is to 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 have this awareness of who I am who am I um away from my sport and um I have gotten into doing personal training I still have a real passion for health for sport for nutrition um I coach here at the local ski club and um it's been uh it's been a lot of kind of self-discovery and rediscovering um some of the passions and at the beginning i thought oh my am i ever going to find something that i'm so passionate about because it's a real it's a real drive it's what you get up for in the morning when you find something that you're so passionate about and i came to realize you know what i don't need to find a new passion i can still take this passion to places it can go down different avenues but i can still let my passion for skiing and for um sport at a top level sport like trying to striving to do your best in whatever you do i can take that with me in whatever i choose to do of course how has that been like getting to be involved in coaching alpine skiing and still being involved in the sport of alpine skiing that you love it's it's fun and I'm really grateful for the opportunities. So I have also had um, kind of right out of the gates, I got an opportunity to commentate for um, Alpine skiing. I did some commentating and then went to Sochi. I've been to the last three Olympic games commentating for the host broadcaster, which is um, the Olympic Broadcasting Services. And I had never thought that I would be any good at it because I like to watch and just sit there quietly. And when you're commentating, you're with you're somebody's next to you kind of like this, you're looking at a screen and you're just having a conversation and talking about it. So that has been a ton of fun. And I am so keen about the sport still. And it's a way for me to find an outlet just to put all that information somewhere, all that energy and all that excitement somewhere. And that uh, combining co some sports commentary and coaching and doing a little bit of fitness and personal training um, for some young athletes is, um, I just, I find it exciting and fun. Has that obviously been like commentating on the Olympic games in the past? Well, it's nerve wracking. I understand. I have a deep understanding of what it's like to stand on that start gate. And I 
feel as though I go through when I'm sitting there watching and the race is about to start. I'm nervous. I'm my guts in a knot because I know it, what's you're, you're about to watch history in the making, right? You're going to get three new medalists. The gold medalist is going to get crowned. And especially at these last Olympics at Beijing where there was no spectators and there weren't even that many come, there weren't many broadcasters that actually came to Beijing. And I got to be there. I got to witness all of the events firsthand. I got to inspect the courses and then sit in a commentary booth right at the finish area. And it didn't, um, it was, uh, I took it all in as a, it was a big moment, right? To be able to be there and experience it. And I still see it as such a privilege and an honor to be able to witness these, um, these races and events. Of course, during your commentating, especially at the Olympic stage, what is that like knowing that all your hard work of being an Olympian and using that hard work from being an Olympian to use your commentating? Yeah, I think, so where um, the strengths I can pull on is understanding the emotions around um, going for that gold medal or the emotions of, even if you're, even if you're standing in the Olympic start gate and you're not a medal contender, you want to perform at your best. So it's that watching the heartbreak and then the triumph um, because there's all of it there. The injuries, some injuries happen at the Olympics and um, it was like tears of joy. And then you feel your heartache for the, 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 the skier that skis out because I know exactly what I would have felt in that moment. So uh, again, it just comes back to, it's a, it's a it really is a privilege to be able to experience that and to take in those emotions and see those racers go through all of that. What advice would you give those college skiers looking to compete in college and then go on to the national level? Uh, I think it's a fantastic avenue. And I think uh, I did not go to NCAA and compete for college, but I had a lot of teammates, a lot of friends who have, and the experience they get, it's a different mindset because all of a sudden now you're competing as a team, right? Your college team. So skiing is an inv individual sport and you don't c really compete as a team. So I think you learn a lot um, and you uh, also get your college education and um, the, the the national team and the World Cup level, it will be there. And if you go work, a, work away at your skiing and get your college degree, I think it's um, a fantastic way um, to, to go through and get to the top. What advice would you have players and even professional athletes that are looking to represent a national team, whether it's Team Canada or Team USA? Well, I think some advice that can actually – be help be helpful and can put into practice you know you hear a lot that it's a lot of time you know being a top athlete it's a lot of time it's a lot of de dedication um to be to win at the top stage there's a lot of falling there's a lot of failure that you need to go through and i think it's understanding get being clear about why you're out there why do you want to try and be the best and if you can answer that easily then you'll get through the hard days you'll get through those days when you fall they feel like you're falling down more than you're standing up you'll get through those gym sessions where you don't want to you don't want to show up um because you're exhausted and it's having that deep understanding of you know why or and imagine yourself staying on top of the podium or imagine yourself winning that event or putting that jacket on because you're because you've qualified for the olympic games and through those tough moments, if you can connect with that, that, that top moment that you're going for, then you're going to, you're going to just, you're, you're going to ease, you, you go through all those challenging moments a little bit easier. What advice would you give those people that are looking to compete for the first time in the Olympics or the multiple times? I think the advice, um, the best advice I can give is to embrace every moment and to yeah. know that when you are there and you feel nervous or you feel a little bit unsure, unsure or you feel these expectations, um, to remind yourself that you've earned that moment, right? You, you've earned that that Olympic spot and you've learned, earned um, the, the jacket that you're wearing. What advice would you give those people that are looking to represent Team USA or Team Canada on the biggest stage at the Olympics? The best, yeah, so to, to represent your country is um, a special moment and it's one to um, take in fully and to really appreciate 
but then get out there and just do the work, you know, get out there and do the work and support your teammates. They'll support you and to learn along the way. Um, there are no bad results. There's just lessons along the way. And the more you can remove yourself from, um, you know, kind of a bad result or as you, as you would perceive a bad result, the quicker you're going to get up again and go strive and, and start skiing faster, ski your best. And yeah, to, to just, to know that everyone's cheering you on and, and, um, wishes nothing but the best. And I think that and is really important to remember. What advice would you give those Olympians that are transitioning from the sport that they love to outside the sport, whether it's starting a family or just outside of the sport? I think you want to make sure you take some time, take some time to decide what comes next. And it's okay also to have to not know or to be unsure. And I myself decided to just start doing one thing and, and um, that led to something else. And it all of a sudden became, started to become clearer and clearer what that next path would, would be. And yeah, to give yourself a little grace and to, to have some patience. What advice would you give those former Olympians that are looking to commentate on the Olympic stage like you did? Uh, well, you have the knowledge. If you want to commentate, you have the knowledge and you can absolutely do it. It's a lot of, it's a lot of fun at the last couple of Olympics. I've actually really enjoyed because there's other ex skiers or Olympians from other countries that I used to race against. And they are also there as the analysts. So it's kind of like a little, a reunion. Um, if I, for myself personally, if it comes to that, I don't really do much more commentating um, down the road. I think I'll be pretty bummed because I really enjoy it. And I really look forward to the next experiences and commentating is about just uh so what I realized uh, when I commentated at the Sochi Olympics and it was like day in and day out, I realized that when you hit on air and the, the show starts, it's a lot like pushing out of the start gate because once they say go and you open the start gate, it's the race is on and you kind of, you have to go with the flow a little bit. So um, as an ex-athlete or racer, you know how to prepare yourself for pushing out of the start gate or for when the whistle goes. And so you can pull, you can know, know that you can pull on a lot of that experience and a lot of those years of training and preparing yourself. That's great advice. Where can my listeners find you at on social media? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram or Facebook. Um, just search my full name, Britt Janik. Uh, I also go by my married name, which is Britt Tilston. And I'm on both platforms pretty regularly. Thank you again, Britt Janik, for your interview. And best of luck in your future, wherever it may hold you. Thank you very much. You can find Brandon Sports Talk on Facebook at Brandon Sports Talk, Instagram at Brandon Sports Talk, Twitter at Talk underscore Brandon. And you can find me on YouTube at Brandon Sports Talk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you again, Brett Chanick, for your interview, and best of luck in your future. Thank you. You've been watching Brandon Sports Talk. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to Brandon Sports Talk on social media and on YouTube.